Hi everyone. On this episode, Jacob and I welcome back C. Derek Varn, last heard on our episode from October called Big Daddy Varn's Baby Leprous Primer. Varn is a teacher, poet, cranky Marxist philosopher, member of the board at Zero Books, and prolific podcaster with his own show, Symptomatic Redness. His first collection of poetry, entitled Apocalyptics, will be available this summer from Unlikely Press. If you enjoy the show and would like to hear more, check us out at facebook.com slash giving the mic. If you subscribe and review us on iTunes, we'll be helping out the show too. Now, on with the show. Hi, I'm Jeremy. I'm a dork living in Portland, Oregon, who spent too many years listening to podcasts and not doing anything creative. This is my attempt to rectify that, to create and contribute something where I talk to people about their cultural obsessions and try to give some recommendations of my own. Welcome to Giving the Mic to the Wrong Person. Chapo's workerism is about skin deep, and uh, it shows. Like It's a very specific milieu from people who kind of idealize a certain kind of politics and a certain kind of people. They're not really from it, and it's fucking obvious. And it shows in the demographics in the DSA, too. So my take on it was um, you got to start somewhere. We are uh, we are recovering from just decades of terrible mass politics. And it's, you know, we, the rupture. So that, here's the thing. I'll go for it. Sorry. In some in, in some ways, the terrible ass politics isn't going to go away just because we wish them to go away. Like, like that was been my critique of like a lot of the arguments made by Amber, for example, is like, you know, we just need workerism again. And I'm like, but you're not going into why it really failed. And it wasn't just the Democrats. Like there's a re there are reasons that that didn't work that you have still not addressed. Some of which are way larger than your pay grade. Um, and if you don't deal with that, then you're you are effectively leading people up and back to revitalizing basically a shell party um, without realizing it. I mean, you're going to end up revitalizing the Democrats to do the same shit they've always done. Where do you think you're not going to change them? You, the, like I said, where where did it go wrong the last time? Well, some of it's not that it went wrong. Some of it's that okay. For example. Um, Part of the uh, the IWW slash SPA critique of trade unions um, is that they needed to be industrial unions because they work across sector, mm -hmm. and that's not the way unions work now. Um, the industrial unions don't work anymore mm -hmm. for two reasons: one, there aren't industrial things to to which that kind of strike model actually applies. Um, you will notice, for example, the most successful things for striking are things like the teachers' union, but these teachers unions, for example, don't structurally work like industrial unions, but mass strikes can actually still work with, in a, with teaching for a couple of reasons um, in ways that they won't work with, say, Walmart. Um, and I have not seen people address that that need for a change in the organizational model and the way that, for example, we moved from trade unions to industrial unions in the early 20th century because trade unions are are – are domain specific and to be completely honest most of the successful union strikes now are professional guild unions and they're kind of labor aristocratic um and i don't see any talk of that like i i, I am actually somewhat skeptical not of the of the teacher strike in west virginia but of being able to solve the problems of education through teacher strike because of things like cost drift and cost exponentiality mm. that um, are not addressed at all and like Jacobin level marketing is just they're just ignoring an elephant in the room and that there really is a financial crisis in education and the issue is the only people getting squeezed by that financial crisis is are, are is um base labor but it's not base labor that's causing the crisis and it's not and also paying them more isn't going to make it go away in fact it'll make it worse um you have cost drift the like of which no one has seen before in almost any field in education and healthcare. And also those are the two areas where the, the, there are the most militant unions right now. Um, but because they're credentialized and so like you can't scab on them easily. 
was you you can't take that and export it to another to another field of work because you can scab on anything else. Right. So you have you have a barrier to entry that makes scabbing structurally impossible, um, and that's not dealt with at all in like DSA or Jacobin talk, and, and it's unrealistic. And like, so you want him to talk to me today about what people get wrong about morality and all this. Well, a lot of this is deeply integrated into what people get wrong. And like, I've been playing nice with the DSA. Um, I've been playing nice with Chapel, kind of for me. I'm not playing nice with Jacobin. I've never have, but um, partly because I know Sankara. But uh, um, I, I might take my gloves off a little bit today, so be warned. Um, All that said, I think we can agree that the Coders Union is a very exciting development, right? I mean, Silicon Valley unionized—that's a—that's just a tremendously exciting concept. It is. It's actually good, but I do worry that it's still basically labor aristocratic. That what? we don't we don't have any way to take the these professional guild. We are essentially trade unions, which again, it's good for there to be any reversal of unionization. Um, but th- these trade unions don't model down. You can't scale it backwards to other to to less skilled forms of work because the scabbing threats are too different. And so. I'm not saying it's not bad. I mean, that it's bad that this is happening. I'm not anti-union in that sense in any way. But I also don't have a union fetish that a lot of people do. I don't think that that just that these certain very high-skilled areas are unionizing is actually going to be able to do anything for the vast majority of workers in the United States. Even though young people... I mean, we have this weird paradox right now... Um, in 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 union world <laughs> where you there's actually more interest and less distrust in unions amongst the young than there's ever been but it's because they've never been in them yeah. um that they weren't they that millennials are largely de-unionized completely and so a lot of the cynicism about unions they don't have and so i mean that's good but they also don't know why it emerged like what happened with the leadership why did so many workers not trust union leadership what could you do to structurally stop that this time? None of that's being discussed. And I mean, I'll tell you one thing, like for me as a teacher, you know, as a, someone who was uh, tried to tried to unionize graduate students in my home state and only to be told that I could be expelled because it was illegal. Um, and public sector unions in Georgia was where I was at the time are illegal. Um, was that um, unions strategically favored older membership over younger membership because older membership have more skin in their game, but younger membership was the future of the union. Just you mean because it was, so it was a structural thing because they favored seniority. Yeah. Oh yeah. And they would, and they would, they would basically, you, you remember when the unions were trying to negotiate stuff with the auto bailout, for example, they f- continuously fucked younger membership. How do you change? And when, oh, sorry. Huh? I was going to say, uh, how would you change that in terms of how would you reorient, 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 reorientate, uh, whatever. Reorient the union? Yeah, re- um, where it's not just, where it's not, because I think before, like, yeah, it was like the historical model for, what, a century plus was always just um, based on seniority alone? Yeah, so you, you basically give all, you basically have to say everybody above the union has equal stakes um, as far as, as far as when you deal with negotiations. And that throws seniority at the door. And it led to weird things like, you know, there's no there was no union in my state of Georgia, like I said, but there was an association. And the association also would strategically betray um, younger teachers who could never get tenure to older teachers who had it permanently. And it eventually led to a situation to where basically all the older teachers who had tenure are now gone. But now that they, they don't really have strong association support um, amongst anybody in the state because the associations are seen as corrupt, um, including the NEA, um, because they consistently did not back younger teachers in times of, of, of like the, the great recession, for example, when they, when even in my state, they just gutted all the younger people every, you know, you just, they were let go even in a state that didn't have union protections, um, by seniority. And that's how they pretty much went across the board. I mean, so like, um, but now, now that just led to an increased dependence on like basically a temporary labor model, hmm. you know, uh, and 
these things are structurally built into this. And um, I, I don't see a lot of discussions. I mean, in all seriousness, I don't see a lot of discussions of that. I also don't see a lot of discussions of the limitations of Taft Hartley for political strikes. And when I do hear out, out of Chapo, they always bring up Berkeley. Well, I can't tell you, I don't under, and I actually don't even really know why. But the Berkeley DA is hesitant to enforce Taft Hartley laws, but every other DA in the country will slap will will basically, you know, slap a union straight down for doing political striking. All right, like, the... it's illegal. Okay, t- cool. Uh, oh, three things. One, uh, can you uh, give a little bit of background info on the Berkeley DA? Two just so we can define our terms for our, 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 our slacker audience. Um, and for my own education, I just, the ex- explanation of, of what is meant by, um, cause I've heard the term, but I'm, I'm not, not been actually all that knowledgeable of what is, um, you know, labor aristocratic. So let's talk about the, the, the DA, the district attorney of, um, Berkeley, of Berkeley and of, of the Bay area. They have not brought suit, um, against unions for political striking, which is something that is totally illegal under the Taft-Hartley Act. And uh, most unions will not do it because the only thing you're really allowed to strike for is your own labor conditions. You can't strike in solidarity. Taft-Hartley was 1947, wasn't it? Yep. Okay. And um, and that is, you know, that that's, 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 that's a legal principle. If you strike, if you do real like solidarity striking or uh, political striking, um, and it's not about your own labor conditions, you can literally do, you lose your union charters, um, which is devastating for a union. So um, it's this 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 thing that's always held over the head. And for for some reason that I actually really don't understand. Militant strikes in Berkeley have never been brought up on this charge where they have every, everywhere else in the country where they've been attempted. And so Berkeley, there was a wildcat strike in Berkeley in the 60s, basically. And then there was the post office wildcat strikes in the 60s. And um, those are strikes that uh, do, you know, are illegal under Taft Harley. Um, they're not sanctioned strikes. What? And uh, there's been a lot, there's been a long standing kind of de facto tradition that I guess for fear of political reprisal um, that in, in the, in the Bay area that you, you are soft on wildcat labor issues like there, but that doesn't, that doesn't scale anywhere else. So the only way to like pull off a, a wildcat strike outside of areas where the DA is soft is for it to be national enough that you can't enforce it. It has to be mass enough that you couldn't that you couldn't enforce it. Um, so it basically, have to be true general strike um, level to do that. How uh, um, how successful do you think the uh, the statewide Wildcats? Because there's 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 one already, and there's at least you know there and there's more coming. Uh, I guess we'll find out very shortly uh, how successful at least the the West Virginia one is. But if there's like several other states where there there's uh, there's rumb- there's rumblings of Bruin. Well, I think these these teacher strikes are are good. Um, don't get me wrong, and, I, and because I sound critical of them, I'm not entirely. Um, but I don't think they're going to be able to deal with the fundamental issues in education, and and one of them is cost drift in education is insane, and it's not driven by teacher cost. Um, how do you uh, how do you take care of cost drift, or how or what's one way of taking care of it? We we have to know what's causing it, and frankly, we don't we don't really even know. Um, so cost drift in the United States is endemic in only two fields, and that is education and healthcare. And the cost drift is both cost to the consumer, um, but it's also cost to the state. And some of it seems to be regulatorily related, like libertarians point this out, but not all of it. And it's not, it, it, it doesn't make sense why, um, why, why the cost to educate, even to me, and I've looked at the numbers pretty hard, has, has gone up exponentially so much. So like, 20 years ago, it would be $5,000 a year per pupil to educate someone in a public school, right? Mm-hmm. And and teachers adjusted for inflation actually made more then. Right. Now, it's almost $20,000 per year per student. Hmm. And teachers make less because their their real income hasn't gone up that much from 
the late nineties <laughs> in a lot of areas. So it's uh, it's, is there administrative drift, but it's not all of it. Like there's there's rent seeking involved. There's a bunch of things. Yeah, I was just saying, is anybody looking at that? The teachers' strikes can't deal with that yet. They're not in a position to deal with that. Like so, they're good. Like they're an objectively good thing. But what um, what someone like David Blacker talks about elimination and ism of education. What he's afraid of is going to happen is that. The teachers will win the strike, and then their jobs are simply going to be eliminated. <laughs> the public education is just going to be seen as too expensive, and it's going to be cut and, like, and not replaced. Instead of cut down and tried to make labor efficient, it's just going to be cut altogether. I have this really exciting idea that I'm working on. It's an app that is going to teach your children for you. It's called Teacher, but without the E. It's very disruptive. I'm looking for investors <laughs> yeah. now. T- yes. Yeah. If you're listening to this podcast, you know, just uh, you know, hit me up on Twitter. Yeah, spelled T E E C H R R R or something. Yeah. We're working yeah. on it. We, yeah. We're still in the. Logo. And that's why the state was investing so much in MOOCs a while back. But MOOCs are parasitic, right? They're like Uber, but they don't. They're even more parasitic, and thus, are, um, don't really work. They're not a sustainable cost model. And you can see that already, and like the fact that the the advocacy for them has died down dramatically. They're also not very effective. Um, from a, a a teacher, yeah. And this I can throw hard numbers around because this is my day job. Um, but from a teacher's perspective, like the the pass fail rates and the success rates on just basic test scores, whether or not you think those are legitimate or not, um, they drop from about sixty five to seventy percent in traditional education settings, as bad as we might think that is, to like thirty percent um, in MOOC and uh, online education in general. Is yes, yeah, we're not quite to the. Um, did you ever read Neil Stevenson's The Diamond Age? No. There's a but... um, one of the uh, there's a bit in it early on where I think the protagonist learns through the book came out in like ninety. I think it came out around like it's like the it's like a book before or after I think it's before uh, Snow Crash which came out like in the early nineties, but the, uh, the protagonist of Diamond Age actually has kind of like a uh, almost a Victorian like you know primer for young girls or something which is effectively uh, like an iPad only you know and th- you know through through that all things are learned because like, that's in the kind of the um, in the particularly weird world you know future world there. Uh, that's how you know she was able to supplant her uh, her crappy education. If I'm remembering the plot correctly, and it's been like 20 years, right? Um, um, that sounds like very techno optimistic stuff. <laughs> have but, you ever, have you ever read a Neil Stevenson book? Yeah, I have. Um, you know, and while I'm nowhere near a primitivist, I would I I, I think there's a a kind of dialectic that's being missed. Like for example. Um, there's been all this sort of like nostalgia for like um, the old taxi system in New York um, and the medallions. The medallions? Yeah. Yeah. Um, because it enabled them to have a real rage or whatever. Um, but what people forget is it also like closed that job off legitimately. And, and so like to, to, to romanticize that as an answer to the problems that Uber's created, because Uber's created a real problem. Right. Um, I mean, you basically have the median – the median um, uh, driver for Uber makes half of minimum wage, according to a study I read today. Right. Yeah, that's um, been p- posted or up and out and around. I should probably link that in the notes. Yeah, and um, uh, and that's obviously terrible, and that disruption is terrible. But th- the fact is that there really was a problem. There really is a problem of, of access and credentialing. And I, I do think you have to be – when we talk about teachers and, and um, licensed professionals that – the, the part of the reason why that's the most advanced part of the proletariat in some ways, and when I, when I said labor aristocratic, here's what I mean. I don't mean like Maoists mean that in a very different way than what I mean it. Okay. Let's... I mean that they're in the top 20% of incomes. Even, even in a place like West Virginia where they make shit, they actually still make more money relative to a lot of the other costs there. It's just that everyone's costs are going up. So, you know, for example... When I lived in uh, Georgia, um, I made, with a master's degree, um, I made $45,000 a year as a teacher, which is um, a little bit more than a West Virginia teacher makes now, and this is 10 years ago. Um, A West Virginia teacher with eight years of experience and a master's degree will make about $45,000 now. 
But in Georgia then and in West Virginia now, that is still actually in the top 80 uh, percent of income bracket. Top 80 or top 20? Top top. Yeah, top 20. Excuse me. It's in the top 20 percent. It's not rich by any stretch of the imagination. It's just you you really have to to remind yourself that like anyone who makes a say Portland or you New York level even subsistence income in those areas is still in an income bracket substantially higher than 90% of the United States. Yeah, it's not like they're making a lot of money just everybody else is that much emiserated. Right. And um and in and, and these areas like West Virginia, teachers don't make shit, but like I mean, there's not a lot of work there, period. <laughs> right. Well, there's the, um, the, I think the stat that, uh, stat that I heard today is something like there's still like 700 openings for that stuff. It's that 700 like teacher openings like in that in uh, West Virginia that ain't getting filled anytime soon. So, but. Oh, yeah. Well, here's the other thing is, is teachers can strike. And this is, this is one of the reasons why this is happening now is because unlike 10 years ago when I entered, there's actually a profound shortage. But. The other thing that people kind of forget is that this is – it is a licensed regime. It's actually very hard to maintain your teacher credential, not in the sense that it's hard to get. It's not like the education's particularly difficult, um, and I, I don't want to sound down on teachers, but that is true. You know, Having been through several kinds of education, teacher education was one of the easiest, mm. um, but that it's – you have to jump through so many kind of dumb and unnecessary hoops – and this is actually part of the cost drift too, to keep your to keep your credentialing. That continuing education stuff and whatnot, or yeah, continue education and making sure it's from the right state and these these kind of rent seeking um, testing regimes that you have to pass yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, all this is tied up into those costs. Yeah, it's it's. Um... To, say my, to bring in my own personal, I guess, experience into it, both of my parents were um, or are retired public high school, retired unionized public high school teachers from Michigan, or at least they taught mm-hmm. in Michigan. My sister started uh, teaching in Michigan and then eventually find, was able to, to escape to Raleigh. Uh, my brother, uh, did, after, especially after he graduated, did some substitute teaching, and I think even myself, I when I was. I think in like in God, like summer of '01, after my lease had run out in Ann Arbor, and I moved because I'd lost my job. Lease had ran out, so I moved back home to Flint and stayed with you know stayed at the parents' place for a little bit. I was even like looking into getting, um, you know, getting what qualified to be a uh, to be a uh, to be a substitute teacher. And, I, and it's one of the uh, I don't know if it's I don't know if it's if it's an irony or if it's emblematic or both. That again, my own folks being. Again, um, very much, cre- you know, they uh, went to university in late, the late 60s, early 70s. Yeah, I think they both graduated like 1970, 71 um, at the time when there's a lot more like progressive education that was being taught to teachers. But mm-hmm. um, in fact, my mom was a student teacher at Kent State that term that all the shit went down. But mm-hmm. uh, so anyway, you know, it's, like I said, the the. It's at some point there. It's almost like you know the the uh, the Reagan Revolution in thing where the, where my folks kind of um, were, you know went up, like I guess again unionized public high school teacher voted for every union destroying politician for the next four to five decades. Oh yeah, that's not completely um, surprising. Yeah, I mean, my but, dad taught college for to, uh, to get into this a little like bit more though. Minutes. I think oh, hold up, hold up, hold up. Oh, on. Jacob, you had a comment. Oh, I was uh-huh. going to say, my dad taught college for a few years. He liked it. No notes. <laughs> there we go. All right. Um, to get into this a little bit more, though, this is why I, I think this stuff about these professionals unionizing is great, but it's not a model for mass worker action. It is explicitly not. Because these are these are sectors of the economy that are protected. Yeah, coders are a little different. Um, it is... It is very highly skilled, but they're not credential protected. You can get people who just can do it. Um, yeah, we need to so, just more like chartered schools teaching like STEM classes. The, the uh, big big push for that. Right. Well, here's the thing with charter schools. Though. Charter schools are still required to hire licensed teachers. Like I, I work at – I actually work at a charter school. I could tell you some things that I'm not going to because I want to keep my job. Class but, trader. Um, <laughs> yeah. Class trader. <laughs> yeah. I don't actually don't see myself as a class trader at all, unless all teachers are class traders. I've actually debated in some seriousness if teachers were actually pros, um, in any sense, because 
um, we are not we do not take any direct role in commodity production, which I think is actually an unfair standard. Uh, I think we are pros in some way, but we are not in the same way that a lot of other people are. Our labor is um, not directly exploited in the same way. I was going to say, what, yeah, it was like at some point, uh, how do teachers fall on the continuum between regular, you know, pro worker, day job well, folks? I, with, I see us versus as labor like, aristocrats. Right. I mean, and I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean, I'm not saying that, like, we're like, we, the, the, in some ways, the labor aristocratic sector is the most militant sector of the economy right now because we still have the ability to strike in it matter. Yeah, teachers and, um, na- teachers and nurses. Right. But it's also it's also in this weird way we, we do that because we're precisely not subject to the same conditions as everybody else, because we're not as easily replaced. Mm-hmm. And and with teachers, frankly, it's legal reasons why we're not as easily replaced, and those legal reasons could be reversed, um, which is luckily states don't seem to be doing that yet. But I, I I'm waiting for that trend of dec- of like. There was a trend in the '90s of of decredentializing that was reversed recently. Mm. Um, actually, uh, ironically, as much as we hate NCLB, it was reversed by uh, NCLB that stopped the decredentializing trend in the '90s. What was the NCLB? Oh, No Child Left Behind. No Child Left Behind. It oh, made, yeah. It made the the movement to like the movement of 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 it getting easier and easier to get a license, a teacher's license, just by you know having any education at all. Um, NCLB moved to stop that. That was and that was like what oh five, oh three. Oh four. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right, yeah. Right about that time. But uh, no. The, but the, the the question I have is in terms of like where teachers fall on the scale between. It's actually it's similar. Uh, you know, are teachers workers or are they cops or are they also you know a part of the you know ideological apparatus of the state? Well, I guess they're going to well, be cops pretty soon. That function, well, in a, in a sense, yeah. Hey, oh my God! If you give us guns, um, <laughs> my own, yeah, my own dad, my own dad filed for a CC for a, for a CCW permit in like his, and he's retired in the exurbs of you know of Tennessee. It's like, Dad, you're not going anywhere. You know, turn off the goddamn cable news. You're not, you know, this is yeah. Anyway, well, I mean, I live in a state that has had the concealed carry law, um, although we we had an argument about it because our, our our charter school actually is quote-unquote more progressive than the, than the public schools are here because we ban firearms from our schools. But Utah is one of the, the mountain states, and they're part of the eight states that allow concealed carry on um, on campuses already. Um, and uh, you know the only thing that's ever happened from it? What's, uh, what's that? A teacher, a teacher shot herself in the leg. Utah elementary school teacher shoots herself in the foot, literally. Another day, another school shooting in America. Only this one is slightly different from your run-of-the-mill bullied teen takes brutal revenge on cruel classmates scenario. This shooting involved Westbrook Elementary School teacher and gun carrier Michelle Ferguson Montgomery, who was getting ready for another day of classes with her sixth graders in Taylorsville, Utah, when she decided to visit the restroom. The details of what exactly happened next are unclear, but what we do know is that at some point Miss Ferguson Montgomery's concealed carry weapon discharged. The bullet hit the toilet basin, sending ceramic shards and bullet fragments into her lower left leg. Other faculty members rushed to her aid upon hearing the gunshot, and she was taken to hospital where she is now recovering. Ferguson Montgomery holds a valid permit for a concealed carry, and Utah law does allow such weapons on campus. Nevertheless, maybe next time she should hang it on a hook when she's got to go. Yeah, that's kind of it's. I mean, yeah, that's the thing is it's like it's like whenever you know what is the what is the what is it, the highest determinant of 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 whether someone commit you know whether whether you know someone commits suicide or not is like what just ready access to firearms. Yeah, although that's only true in the United States. That yeah. does not actually – that is not the highest – okay, you're, you're going to get me on a, on a particular kick that you probably don't want me to get on, okay, on, then, gun, on gun stuff. But I find the gun debates in the United States from both sides to be fundamentally dishonest. Um, yeah. uh, uh, when, when, for example – Everyone brings up Australia, and I'm like, well, the conservatives have a point when they brought when they bring up that um, Jamaica's gun laws are stricter and their gun homicides are higher. And Switzerland, because the 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 what what that's tied to 
is not just the laws. It is not just regulation that makes those laws work. And it's overall over overarching culture. No. Oh. I mean, culture is part of it, but you know what? What the? What Jeremy? The fuck is culture? Yeah. Um. Yeah, Jeremy. It's, it's a ser- it's a series of Ian Banks novels set in the far future. <laughs> um, starting with Player of Games and moving on to I think was right. it considered Fleavis? Yeah. Isn't Amazon yeah, adapting so- that? I'm excited. Maybe I want probably. you. I want you. Here's here's my here's my issue with that, and I've always said that. So culture is what people do collectively, right? Right. How do you define it? What people do collectively. So you explain what people do collectively by what they do collectively. It is what it is. Yes. Does what it says. Yeah, on, it's, it's, does what it it's says on the tin. Logic. Yeah. So I actually do like whenever someone mentions culture to me and they're not explaining what element they're talking about, I'm always like, uh, you're being circular and you're hiding it in language. Um. So so here's where there's a truth to it. It's not, um, so for example, I'm going to take, I'm going to take the two things that are cited the most and I'm going to compare and contrast the differences between them. Um, so let's take, let's ignore the Mexico, Jamaica, and all those countries where they have the same gun laws as, as the UK and Australia and they utterly don't work. We will just throw them out. And I'm going to ignore Russia for a second, for a second too. I'm going to just factor that out. Now I'll tell you why. Um, but I'm just going to compare... Uh, the UK and Australia ended mass shootings. But the problem with that is there's a sample size of one. One country. And one mass shooting. That was it. And there wasn't any more. Um, the murder rate in Australia for, for gun homicides went down, but the overall murder rate went up, then then the same, and then went down. Um, if you look at what it actually correlated to... Um, the gun laws basically became effective when there was when the economy was better. So, and so my point to then about this is that is not that gun laws may not work; is that they only work in conjunction with other things. In conjunction with other things. Yeah. So, if you think you're going to fix the mass shooting problem just by passing a gun law, which is actually a very small part of the U.S. violence problem, um. You're probably very wrong. And also, for example, in the United States, we have a super high suicide rate in some areas, and it does seem to be access to guns that is the biggest correlative factor. Yeah. But if you look at, say, Japan, which has a super high suicide rate, and no guns, and not even many swords. <laughs> well, they have. They... Jason, People Jay, jump in Jay, front of trains. I was going to say, they have more access to trains. No, Jacob, you look quizzical at that, at that statement. <laughs> well, I don't know. I'm not sure what's going on. I think all you know mass uh, mass ownership of weaponry other than firearms. I guessing, I don't know. Yeah. Um, speaking of speaking of culture, uh, Jacob, did you, uh, you wanted to ask about you wanted to ask a particular culture related question? Well, I mean, we're kind of already in the middle of it, so go ahead. Oh, uh, who do you like for the Oscars tonight? That's why I'm uh, here. Actually, I, I, I just don't wanted to ask TV. that question. I'm going to probably leave after this. Sorry, uh, uh, Derek, you didn't hear... What was your response? Didn't hear that? I don't watch TV. <laughs> all right, well, there's your answer. There we go. Okay, hey, all, all right. right. Yeah. Ten, sec- ten seconds and well, subject I mean, covered. Oscars are about movies, though. You want, I mean, you know, I don't... Uh, yeah, but I would have to watch... The, I don't even know who's nominated this year. I, I used to really care about this stuff, and then I lived abroad for eight years, and um, I I feel poorly equipped to answer. I, I, I think maybe that Three Billboards movie looks interesting. <laughs> <laughs> well, all just, I got, man. <laughs> just to make myself feel better, I'm going to hastily drag this actually back on topic. Um, how do you feel about the arguments with regards to the glorification of gun violence in media and all that? Uh man. Okay, that's tough. Um, got him. I I tend to be skeptical that the media creates culture so much as reflects it now obviously it's it's a hyperbolic reflection you know like there's no way that the united states is as violent as the as the media culture prepare, portrays it as but um i think our i think our cultural acceptance of it is actually partly because we are not as in tune to all the violence in our own society as we should be um that said uh i would love for it to i i would love for for like tv shows to be um 
I remember when I was in Canada and I was getting British TV and I like and after 8 p.m. come on and you'd see like you know basically nudity on TV. Yeah. And and um CBC was good for that. Yeah, that was totally okay. But uh violence would get you, you know, like a very strong R rating and you couldn't get shown um on regular television. And I don't know something about that, and, and maybe this is like my own my own crypto liberalism or something. But something about that just seems like it's actually more healthy. <laughs> like it is kind of weird that you can show a beheading on like CSI and like no one blinks an eye at all. Um, uh, but you know there are there are conversely there are plenty of cultures that are plenty violent that that are way more violent than us that censor their the violence on the television. So. I mean, like, you can't show a lot of the super violent stuff in Latin America, and that doesn't mean that the murder rate in Honduras isn't, like, 80, like literally 10 times what it is in the United States. So, you know, um, I guess, you know, it, to get bring it back to the topic, you wanted me to talk about mistakes that leftists make, yeah, right? one of, yeah, well, there's yeah. Like, yeah, there's, like, two of the topics that I wanted to cover today. One of them was, can you talk about what... Yeah, like what do like a lot of those leftists keep getting wrong? Well, yeah, what they keep Europe is and America is a whole damn crawling. world. So you're saying, hang on a second, uh, Jacob. What'd you say? I was just saying, you know, your leftist is a little older now, conversing more, you know, walking out, exploring the world, really, really developing. So let's let's continue this and learn a little bit more about uh, our growing leftist. Okay, so the, my, my first thing is like actually learn something about the world belong, beyond the the top ten countries in the OECD. Um, liberal liberal media, no, but liberal media really does when they talk about like world comparisons, they will only use the top eight countries in the OECD when talking about the United States because we're an outlier in those eight countries. What's the OECD stand for again? The uh, the organization of something developed. Um, like the G8 types or? Yeah, basically. Okay. The, the, well, I mean, it's basically your G20 types. Gotcha. But the top 10 are the G8. It's Western Europe, Canada, um, Japan, and Korea. Right. Your G unit, as it were. Yeah. And it, it does include <laughs> Russia, but you will see Russia strategically excluded from almost all of these comparisons. For example, on the murder comparison, no one ever mentions Russia because while Russia has very low gun homicide rates its homicide rates are higher than the U.S.'s. They just kill people with knives. And what I was going to say about comparing Australia to the U.K. is Australia actually saw a decrease in crime because it saw a decrease in uh, in inequality. Uh, The U.K. has had the opposite trajectory. While there there are still very few murders, and there's almost no murders by cop in the U.K., um, actual violent crime rates in the U.K. have actually gone up exponentially since Thatcher. Um, They're just stuff like knife attacks and acid attacks. And because there is a national health system there, they're not fatal. But, and admittedly, New York is not the worst case. This is a a UK misunderstanding, but I was reading, you know, the Guardian was even talking about how London is more dangerous than New York, even in raw murder statistics. Um, well, yeah. Well, New York since nineteen ninety what two has been a much was a was a much different place, right? And so that's part of their misunderstanding. But the the other thing is the the murder rate in the United States is higher than the OECD, but it's actually not as high as you think it is. Um, it's between four and six per hundred thousand. And for example, Mexico is fifteen per hundred thousand on average. And Honduras is like forty-five to eighty per hundred thousand, right? Mm. Um, and uh, Jamaica is really high too. And there's just there is this you know uh, people who are constantly critiquing Eurocentrism and like you know you know the white world as, as supposedly leftists are doing. They only ever cite that. They only ever deal with that. Um, and the other thing that's the big elephant in the room is the UK and Australia and even Canada, they were never ground zero for gun manufacturing for the world. The US is. Having both the, uh, the both the actual factories here, but also the uh, the the, well, the massive cultural slash lobbying group. Right. Uh, you know, 
The IG- both things. Yeah. Both things exist. But even if you got rid of the NRA, you still have the fact that we it's a ma- we're a massive gun producer. Um, hey, Canada, for the entire planet. Canada's trying to get up there with the with their own like arms sales, so they're uh, they're 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 striving too. Yeah, I mean, and there are things like that. It's hard for the gun regulate for the hardcore no gun regulation. I mean, the people who want to ban guns entirely to explain because Canada has a pretty high gun ownership percentage, actually, even with the gun restrictions that it has. And I mean, everybody kind of knows that from even Michael Moore's documentary fifteen years ago. But it's true. Yeah, that I was going to say that was that was even he got it's one of the things that I think was almost buried because of how he structured the thing where the, yeah the, the stat of of Canadian firearm owner ownership. But, you know, there's another trend right now on the left that is fascinating to me, because right now you, you it, I think liberal liberal left liberals are pretty much unanimously in support of gun control. But on the left, there's a contrary position put out by people like Redneck Revolt, who like we need to arm to fight the reactionaries. And I'm also horrified by that, because one, most leftists have never fought in a military and most two percenters have. Um, two percenters or three percenters? Three percenters, whatever percenters are. Yeah. But most militia members are ex-military. Right. <laughs> um, two, and when I, and, when, and and as a person with arms training myself, when I see uh, when I see leftists like go up at a demo with guns, I'm always like, you don't need, you obviously are holding that as if you don't know how to use it. Like what you were doing in a in a combat situation would get you killed very quickly. Like you, this is a hobby for you. You need to stop. Um, and two, like the United States has nuclear weapons. Let's be honest, man. Like, like if, if part of the reactionaries is the police and the military, you don't stand a chance. Um, so I, 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 I don't want to like, I also think running to the opposite position becoming like, you know, the left NRA is, is equally kind of dumb. Like, and I know that makes people feel like I'm saying, you know, neither this nor that. But I am kind of actually saying that. You have to be realistic about this. If you want something like just a single issue thing, and that's the single issue approach I think is never smart for a leftist. That's another one. But it, even if you were approaching it, you have to look at the entire social gestalt when making policy. And um, you would have to back up those gun laws with, like, proper psychiatric care – um, poverty reduction, um, proper health care, et cetera, or they wouldn't work. So if you, if you think you can just one issue legislate problems away, that's not how social issues work. Now, admittedly, I don't think most leftists think that way. This That's more of a liberal problem, although most leftists were at one time or maybe still are liberals, and that's okay. Let's say, let's should uh, should we def- uh, just for the audience sake? Can you can you give your own working definition between or dividing line between liberal and leftist? I think, okay, so yeah, there, the, you you opened a can of worms here, but um, <laughs> well, I actually uh, define uh, well, another pretty much okay. the entire American political t- tradition as liberal. All right, make, yeah, that's about right. Um, even Republicans to me are liberals. Right. They're just a, they're just like react. I call them right liberals. And then there's left liberals who are Democrats. Um, Matching up with what Adam Curtis said. Yeah. Yeah. I think of leftists as not anti-liberal, but post-liberal. We come we most of us, even historically speaking, we come out of that tradition like Marx and Engels were liberals first. Right. But we're critiquing it. It is insufficient. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so. So I think leftists are trying to critique – I think part of what we're doing is critiquing liberalism as saying you can't deliver on what the goods you say you're going to deliver on. This egalite, fraternite, equality thing, you've never actually you know, put it on the table. And so you either need to put it on the table or we need to figure out a way to make you. Um, and that's what I think defines the leftist. Now, there are two kinds of leftists. There are – well, actually, I shouldn't say that. There are a million kinds of leftists. But there are two kind of basic ways of thinking about it. And and to me, this is even bigger than, say, like Marxist anarchist differences. There are people who work electorally and people who think you have to work insurrectionarily. And then people like me who kind of think you have to kind of do both. Like um, I, for example, think most of the time voting doesn't matter, but you should still do it. Yeah, I was going to say, let's give some examples here of, of electorally versus insurrectionally. 
Well, there are, there are people like say like um, some Maoists or some anarchists who think the only way you could ever deal with things politically is to literally overthrow the state in an insurrectionary revolution. That's what we need the guns for. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, well, I mean, you, you hear people like redneck revolt and say literally say that like that's not even a, a, a an exaggerated position. Um. Then uh, there are people who think you need to work electorally to achieve it, like the DSA, maybe. Although the DSA is very hard to, to pin down right now because its influence of members has been so so rampant that its social – its ideological basis is actually changing yeah, faster than it can handle yeah, um, in some ways, yeah, which is good. Yeah, I was I mean, going to say because like, I think that's – one of the things I think a, a lot of – like some of the critiques that I've seen of like DSA stuff was almost like – Still, tre- um, still treating the DSA as if it were, an, you know, the organization from 1983. And... Right. Whereas I think that the best analogy to the DSA is like the SDS. It's just smaller. Right. I mean, it's bigger than any other socialization, socialist organization, but it's still a third of the size of the SDS at its height. Right. Um, Got to start somewhere. For, for, yeah. for your listeners who don't, who are normies and don't speak uh, historical left jargon, the SDS is the social uh, is the Students for Democratic Society. They were the foundation of both the civil rights and new communist movement, depending on how you view it. Yeah, aka the movement. I think was the uh, yeah. how everybody referred to it. Way they back also when. they also had a spinoff that was, shall we say, considerably more insurrectionary. Oh, they had several spinoffs. They were considerably more insurrectionary. I, I, well, I Some think of in one in particular. Only managed to kill themselves, though. Yeah. yeah. Um, so. Yeah. The, well, yeah. One of the book that yeah the, one of the the books you recommended last time I think go into that detail. And I remember reading. In fact, yeah, Verso is reprinting. Um, I think it was reprinting. I think uh, was it Elbaum's Revolution in the Air, which is a great book. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then, so I always suggest people read. Um, that one, there's a book that uh, my the, the publication I work for released on the RCP. I mean, the RCP, for example, and the CPUSA had actually infiltrated. I mean, this is this is funny because they were infiltrated by COINTELPRO, but they actually had infiltrated the leadership of the SDS. That was actually true. Um, yeah, remember- and they thought they could pivot it towards um, sort of either Soviet or Chinese communism. What, what, but the SDS wouldn't actually like formally adopt a socialist line. You remember what which the part uh, of why it dissolved? What the uh, what the um? You, I think you're referring to zero books. Remember what the what the zero books title? Heavy radicals. Heavy radicals. Okay, that's the title. I was and then the other book I told you to read was the book on the set on the sixties and seventies. Um, it was just journalism, basically about the same groups, and that was what was that book? Uh, it wasn't Days of Rage, was it? Or it was like yeah, it was Days of Rage. Okay. Yeah. And I always tell people read those three books, and then read the book, read a couple books on COINTELPRO, whichever ones you can get. Um, and I think you'll get a good, a good feel for the new communist movement. Gotcha. Um, and the end of the civil rights, and uh, the end of the civil rights era, and all that. Um, we are kind of in a similar time um, right now, and which does lead the, to the horrifying conclusion that Trump may be Nixon. <laughs> Um, but, um, the Democrats have utterly lost, like, like, I know I'm going to sound really unpopular, but in some ways, like Bernie Sanders is kind of like George McGovern in some very key ways. Um, and a lot of raw sexual charisma. (laughs) Well, well, for a guy who's going to be 80 by the next election. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's the thing he's, Hey, like the. Bert, like I said, somebody just pointed out that Bernie Sanders was only six months older than Harrison Ford. So. <laughs> I know it's it's a uh, well, you know, Harrison Ford's a very special man. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, um, so I think I think to to I'm interested in the D and the DSA because the DSA does hold a promise of something that I've been interested in, like the IWW for trying to be too, which is a non-party massive political organization but i'm also critical of it for the same reasons because i do i think it's gonna i think there's gonna be some massive fallouts in this ideological shift that's happening within it and particularly on its actual relationship to the democrats it's going to become more and more contentious um in both directions i i that's my prediction and that's fine i mean that's natural but what's going to 
what are we going to do with that? Like, you know, you, you keep saying to me, you have to start somewhere. And I completely, I actually completely agree with you. you we all have to start somewhere. Um, and a lot of us started with Occupy, right? And Occupy was never going to succeed. Right. But it was important how it failed and where we, and how we got politicized by it, right? I mean, DSA is going to be even more important, I think, because it's institutionally like that. But in that critique, I'm already telling you, I think the DSA is going to fail. Like, it's not going to do what it thinks it's going to do. Um, what is well, and, what does the failure meter? What does it actually look like? But I, well, I don't know, and I, I'm not a prophet. Oh. What, what I think is going to happen is that there, like the, these caucuses are going to get more and more reified, and they're going to be there are going to be stronger and stronger splits over well, time. Just splintering, yeah. Listen. The only people we ate more than the Romans are the fucking Judean people from yes. Yes. Split 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 and the Judean popular people from oh, yes. Yes. Split 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 and the people's split. front of Judea. Yes. Yes. The people's front of Judea, splitters. We're the people's front of Judea. Oh, I thought we were the popular front. People's front. Whatever happened to the popular front? Eh? He's over there. Splitter! And there's also, and this is already happening, there's also an attempt by a lot of groups that currently exist to enter it and cannibalize it, just like there was in the SDS. Like, there are a whole, like, tiny political secliques whose entire membership are joining the DSA, partly to get people into their secklet. You know, like... For example? Um... Oh man, I hate out and comrades, but... Well, you don't, like, well, I mean, just at some point, just in, like, or not even comrades, just like, like, I don't know... The Communist League of Tampa, for example, most oh, okay. members have joined. Um, a lot of the people in the SPUSA have joined both organizations, even though they're historically opposed to each other. Gotcha. Okay. Um, there's a there there are Democratic Centralist organizations which are currently banned, actually, under DSA charter. It's one of the few things that the, the DSA and the SPUSA both have is a ban on Democratic Centralism, but they are entering the the organization on purpose. All right. Um, you see this in the formation of subgroups within the DSA, like the Knights of Labor, who take standard Stalinist lines. Um, but the, here's the thing. It's very hard to, to, to talk about the DSA because the locals are so independent that they don't even all share like the same um, like uh, the same like hospitality and uh, civility charters and stuff aren't the same from 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 city to city or even from like Brooklyn to New York proper. You know, right. Um, so it's very hard to generalize. And the DSA in New York that say the DSA in Portland has absolutely no dealings with it at all. Um, but I think there's going to be a, a, a lot of strain on the national. And the other thing is the DSA doesn't actually have that much money. <laughs> um, and uh, because it, its fees are I, part of how it's grown so fast is its fees are kind of low. Right. For, there's a low bar to membership. And I don't even know that the locals always have to like the locals can put stipulations on how the national uses their money, I think. So, like, I think locals are trying to say, like, the national can't give any of our money from to the national select like, Democratic candidates, even if the national wants to. Right. I would say I'm a I'm, I'm a dues paying DSA member in and I have no idea. Yeah. And I've, I've talked to many people about it. And this is an organizational problem. And the DSA, frankly, Itself doesn't really know what to do with it because because it was so I mean it was it was, it it grew to about five thousand members under under Reagan and then like froze there in nineteen eighty five. Right, that was the uh, I mean even like Larry website the guy one of the guys responsible for helping grow it you know I think I think even he res described it as for the longest time for for decades it was a you know quote unquote glorified book club. Yeah, I mean, and in some ways I mean like. When I was interested in the DSA for the first time was uh, in the early 2000s, right? Myself, I was coming out. I ended up going right wing because of how messed up the left was, and this is another story for another day. Okay. But um, but um, uh, I was very interested in DSA because I knew Cornell West, but they were taking positions like to the right of uh, like some just kind of radical liberal activist groups at the time, you know, like. There was very much a weird kind of popular frontist feel to them. Whatever happened to the popular front? Right? In a way, and they had members that were almost neoliberals. It was a very strange time. And then in the, in the end of the Bush years, 
like you had Aaron Wyke and Cornell West become more important and they were like leaders in the progressive movement, et cetera. But they, you really didn't like, I barely knew that those people had any relationship to the DSA. Yeah. The, the, well, and, the W years were a screwed up time for many people, uh, for many different reasons. The W like the politically and domestically. Yeah. Well, I think, that, and we have for one of the weird, this is another warning to your, to your younger comrades. Do not scrub the most recent history from your mind because of the vulgarity of Trump. Because, and I'm going to be unpopular for saying this, Trump as of yet has not killed as many people as George W. Bush has. Right. I mean, I mean you know, that's, that is an objective fact. I'm wondering if I'm wondering, but if is 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 the scrubbing on the part of, I don't know if yeah, I was say is the scrubbing the part of the young uh, of, I don't think the I scrubbing think it's is the, it's not the fault of the younger members, it's the fault of like like the it's professional the fault of the me- older members and well the, and, and the, the professional media types who uh, you know kind of need that you know need to hang on to their to their you know mediating um, you know mediating interpreting what job function or something. Well, no, I completely agree with you. It's not, but this is, but this is my warning to them. This is, this is like, it's going to be on them because of that. It's going to be on them to educate themselves about, you know, the 2000s and the 90s in a way, because they're easy to forget. And there's also a lot of nostalgia about it. I mean, we're we're coming up on 20 years since the battle for Seattle, which, you know, I was 18 years old when that happened. I, that was my first real political event. I traveled from Georgia to Seattle to partake in, in that and I mean, I tell the story a lot. Like I, I, that was, I, I left kind of disgusted, but I still felt kind of left wing. And, you know, by the time I was 22 and heading over, my, you know, my, my senior year of college to, or 21 to Sea Island um, to protest and no one was there. What was Sea Island? And sea Island was the, was the, the, the next G8 summit in the United States. It was in Georgia. Oh, okay. And it, but it was after 9-11 and, the anti-globalization left, um, which is, you know, it doesn't mean what it means now, thanks to a lot of changes in the way we use language, um, uh, had died. And, you know, you know, who got me on board was people from antiwar.com and a lot of right wingers because they were more consistent in their war. And at the time when I had met left wingers involved, they were either obviously Democratic Party hacks or they were like members of International Answer, which was this weird coalition of like Maoist and Trotskyist groups who were blatantly being frontist and like doing stuff like critical support for Ahmadinejad and, I, and, and stuff like that. Which um, would I like? And I was like, who needs Cohen P- Telpro when you have friends like this? Like, you know, I do like it, yeah, it's like almost answer. as bad as yeah. the Spartacist League, which is a Trotskyist organization, uh, one of the more extreme ones. Um, you know having stuff like critical support for ISIS and Al Qaeda, you know, and I remember seeing some of that stuff as a college anti anti war activist and conspiracy theory culture was rampant. And, um, the, the, uh, so it wasn't a right wing too, but I didn't know that. And the libertarians actually, like, even though I was never really a libertarian in the sense that I never really fully endorsed, um, like free market economic policies, quote unquote, and neoliberal, neoliberal or order liberalism. Mm -hmm. Um, but they they were more consistent in uh, uh, you know fighting the war and that's who I got involved with, and yeah, I, I I use that as my own cautionary tale for my own life as like hey single issue stuff can lead you into some weird shit yeah uh, Jacob <laughs> well I was gonna say the things that people say about Trump I actually remember fairly well because they were things that people were saying about Bush and I think one of the great ironies is that i think bush did a lot to basically destroy some fairly fundamental institutional ideals and and systems and took us down a fairly nasty path but when our guy got in charge nobody cared anymore and they were happy to let you know things like guantanamo slide Oh, oh yeah, well, Gu- Gu- Guantanamo was my first breaking point. Yeah, it was yeah Guantanamo was some was like yeah that I think that was there was a I think that was, was complicated. And I think there was some folks who were fine with letting it slide, and other people, it, you know, who lacked the power to change it, but were still trying to talk about that. But yeah, but agree. So so look, my, on my own, I've never been a Democrat, and I take pride in that. But um, I've never been a Republican either, and I take pride in that. But I did. Um, 
I voted for Mike Ravel in the primaries when Mike Ravel, I mean, when Mike, when Mike Ravel, uh, Gravel lost, obviously, because that was a hopeless lost cause. Um, I, I, um, I actually campaigned for Barack Obama for a little while. Then I saw, but the moment I saw his cabinet choices, I immediately stopped and I voted third party in the election that year. Um, because I, I, I was fairly, this, I was actually doing the whole, um, the whole like, uh, Chomsky calculus back then. But I was like, okay, so if I vote for, for whoever, because, because McCain's going to carry Georgia anyway, it doesn't matter what I do. I can vote my conscience. So I'm going to, um, now I don't think that way anymore. Um, but my point about that is nothing that Obama did surprised me because Obama immediately put, and I think kind of, he didn't have a choice in a lot of ways, but he was trying to put the democratic establishment, you know, into a sense of, um, like, don't fight me. And so you saw this continuation in his cabinet of a lot of the, of the Clinton era people. And I predicted my, 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 this is one thing where I did play profit and was right. Um, that the Democratic Party after Obama was going to be in bad shape because he didn't bring anyone else up with him because he was always trying to appease the Clinton people to stop that, you know, to stop the, you know, and he was always fairly moderate, actually. But there was all these people who were kind of pretending he was going to be in a, on both sides, pretending he was going to be kind of a left wing internal insurrectionist, right? And they went after people like Van Jones and whatever. Yeah, it was, I think that was. I remember reading people even at the time saying, uh, talking about that just by the, the picking Joe Biden as his running mate. Yeah, and when I saw Joe Biden, you know, I, and I saw a lot of the people he picked, particularly for his economic council, when he picked on Duncan for a Secretary of Education, I was, I was, and, and when I saw this coming up before even he'd won, you know, who he's talking to, I was like, this is not going to be what we think it is. And then I remember, like, for example, when he didn't end the Afghan war. I mean, this is a war that I've now been protesting for most of my adult life, by the way. Yeah. I'm 37 years old. I started protesting that war at 21. <laughs> I laugh because I'm sad. There, there but, we um... <laughs> it is interesting, though... I do have to remind myself how much the discourse around, say, um, not I think race has not gotten a lot better, but like the discourse around sexuality has changed so profoundly in a very short time. How so? So much that even I forget it. Like, you know, the like Obama hid hid his support of gay marriage because it was a radical position in two thousand eight. And by 2010, it was completely normalized, and no one could believe. Why would you have to hide that? Yeah, I think even like the Onion had a great story about that of the Supreme Court. It, yeah, I mean, and, but it, it's it's it is strange. I was thinking, you know, the, the, the God, you, you would think I'm bring this up in this podcast, but I was watching. Um, my wife was saying, "Hey, let's watch Queer Eye for like nostalgia's sake. We can remember our 20, the new one, right? The one that just yeah. came out." And we we're both like, "This is so tropey and icky, kind of." Um. But the original one or the new one? How the new one? The new one, the new one, because it's like the original one. And but the, at the time, I remember the original one being like a big damn deal. Oh yeah. Uh, and that's only ten years ago. Not it's actually just barely over ten years ago. I mean, it's like yeah. eleven, twelve years ago. It's like queer eyes. That, that was like that was that started in 03. That was like fifteen years ago. Because I remember it was before. I remember I watched a couple episodes before it even. Watched a couple episodes and and they were talking about it on Live Journal, so that must have been yeah. So that and that was before I left Ann Arbor, so that must have been like oh three oh four or something. Then I God, remember I remember ago. talking about it on Live Journal. Yeah, but um, as a side note, I keep a Live Journal just to remind myself what the net used to be like, um, because you can still like go and see Post Secret and Low Cats on Live Journal, and they have still continued making stuff as if nothing has changed. Yeah, some it's people pretty... like said it's yeah. It's at one point I thought of, I thought about just for like opsec of like deleting my old live journal account and like I'm gonna. But it's the kind of thing where like oh, shit. I want to say I have posts on there going back to what o one or o two. I was like I have, I, I, I have posts going back to live journal to two thousand. I deleted mine, but I archived it on Greenwith. And um, but I have posts going back in some form to two thousand. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, the past is a and, different country, uh, kids. Yeah, th- th- this is this is. 
This is uh, what are you a younger Gen Xer and I'm the oldest millennial. Yeah, I'm. Uh, um, yeah, I'm right on the. I guess. Well, I was right on the edge of Gen X. Now it's like the edges got pushed back a little bit. So I'm like, I'm. I'm I'll be 42 this year. So. Yeah. So you you and I are actually close cohorts, but you're about five years older than me. Right. So. Yeah. Um, and Jacob here is the youngest of us all. Yep. That's okay. We're all ancient in left years. Um. Because in left in the left years you die at thirty. Carousel, carousel. <laughs> why didn't he just go, year, yeah? Why didn't he just renew like Logan's Run? Yeah. <laughs> unless, unless of course you're a child of '68, in which case you dominate the left politics until you die. There's this weird dichotomy where, like, when I when I became involved in the left, everyone was either younger than me. When I became involved in the left the second time, everybody was either way younger than me or they were like. My grandfather. I think you know, yeah. there was no in between, and that's still kind of true. Yeah, the like, yeah the um I think even like a, at a chapter meeting, somebody brought up about they called it the uh, the the in, in terms of like DSA membership and in, in the age range, the they call it the Gen X donut hole, as everybody there is either under thirty or over sixty. Right, and you know I'm an older millennial, I guess technically I'm not technically well. Depending on which dating system you use, sometimes I'm Gen X, sometimes I'm Millennial. I'm in that weird cohort that people call Gen Y that's claimed by both. Or, um, or even better, the and X, what is it, X Annual? I think that was... Yeah, X Annuals, which is, I'm like, oh, come on, we already had a word for that. Um, but what, what was funny, what's interesting about that is I do think there is some truth to that cohort being different than the rest of the Millennials because, A, we actually remember the fucking Soviet Union. And, t- um, and life before cell phones and social media. Yeah, social media on I, mean, I didn't phone. get a cell phone until I was twenty two. Yeah, I was. Yeah. It was. I was twenty five, twenty six. But yeah, yeah but we're, we're, again, that would have been roughly the same time. Our, so, our co-host, you can't hear. It. Our co-host is rolling his eyes at me. What? Don't look at me. <laughs> these were these were important dates. March <laughs> March two thousand and one. I got my first uh, my first Nokia uh, Nokia candy bar cell phone. It was uh, it was important. What can I say? Oh, that was, that was me, man. That was like, uh, I think I got mine in September of, uh, of 2002. So, yeah, literally almost the same time period. Yeah. Um, it, oh, side note, um, is it just me? I think this was brought up and uh, uh, posted uh, and uh, pointed out within the last week, but just the... Not 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 an irony. It's like it's like, in fact, it's so perfectly fitting that one of the two marketing guys who came up with the term millennial um, was a co-founded the Capital Steps, <laughs> and it's kind of like that's like how that's like one of the most perfect things. I'm like, of course he did. Of course, yeah. He, it's you know. fu- it's funny. I don't remember millennial being used when I was when I was actually in college. I mean, that's no, it was Gen thing. Y. I think it yeah. Came- do you know the year it was that we switched from that? Because when I was in college, everyone actually did use Gen Y. I don't know. I think, um, I think it was the same. Um, I don't know. I think it was like the, kind of the same thing that happened. Uh, it was like that same shift that happened when like about 95, 90. Yeah, well, 90. I think it was right after Clueless became a hit that MTV decided that they were going to they, they were going to stop courting uh, like Gen Xers like they had and now focus on uh, the you know younger teenagers effectively shifting from Gen X to Gen Y. And then like and, and MTV changed. But like when it, when it went from Gen I to from Gen Y to Millennial. I don't know. Maybe when somebody like who, whoever was the first uh, person on the New York Times uh, op-ed board decided to, you know, write, you know, the the the, uh, the latest, you know, start the latest wave of kids today. Um, yeah. Well, here's the thing about that, though. Do you remember those first? I do remember the first millennial article I ever read. OK, the millennial article I've read. And here's where I get this is another cautionary tale for for our left wing friends about predicting demographic changes. Everyone talked about how right wing they were. South Park Republicans and such? Yeah, well, do you remember? And it's just, oh, 05, everyone's like, millennials have more, and they still have more faith in institutions, actually, than even, like, younger millennials have more faith in institutions than me. But the, the, they didn't, they didn't ha- feel the same need to rebellion. They weren't left-wing inclined. They were probably going to be more religious than the, than the prior decade, because they were at the time, in 2005, 2006, when they first did the cohort studies. Right. Um, and then shit changed. Funny how that and works. And then shit changed because a the economic situation changed, and b like they grew up. Um, and so I'm very and I also don't know that we know. Everyone's like, well, millennials are still super, you know, progressive. I don't know that they're necessarily going to stay that way. Like 
I, I don't think we can predict the politics. I mean, one of the things that people haven't talked about about the Trump phenomenon um, is that older Gen Xers and boomers, they still like frame this, for example, in terms of like fighting evangelical Christians versus like progressive secularists and stuff. That's not relevant to the Trump phenomenon, but it's people like reading things in their own culture. Uh, and again, I, I am very hesitant to have cultural explanations for things for the reasons that I said earlier. It's circular, but in like their own narrative tropes, right? But what's all, and, yeah, it's like it's like yeah, uh, political understandings formed either in the '90s or especially during the W era, kind of just are now back again and, and not really changing. So it's. You know, the, yeah, like even though it, the context is completely different. Yeah. I mean, like to me, what I mean, there are profound differences between Trump and and Bush, and I, I'm going to get in trouble for saying this. They actually kind of favor Trump, um, and not in the way that I think Trump's policies are good. I don't think that at all. But but Trump isn't really ideological, and his alliance with like say evangelical Christians is only because they they fear Hillary Clinton, not because he's actually represents them in any way. If anything, it indicates that they're kind of dead as a political force. Right. That's uh, I think Sarah Jones and a couple other people uh, at New Republic and other places have like pointing that out, especially with all the uh, with all of the uh, very recent Billy Graham uh, write ups. Right. Yeah. I mean, if you think about like Trump versus say like if, if Ted Cruz had won, then I would be like, oh, we have the revitalization of the evangelical. But I mean, what's weird is the evangelical support Trump more than they even supported Bush. Um, but it's it's because they're not they, they, as a political force. They're more and more irrelevant. And um, secularization is beginning to kick in. Um, and for example, uh, uh, an elephant in the room that isn't talked about, but for reasons of both immigration and material and material backing and also conversion, like the largest Christian groups in the United States are all now Catholic. So this whole thing is, is like, like that the, fighting the nineties, because that's what we know. And in a way, the nineties is even fighting the sixties because that's what we, our parents knew and forced down our throats over and over again. Yep. 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 Um, we, the, Trump is going to be the last bastion of that. That's, he he's going to be the last boomer president, probably. I could be wrong because the Democrat opposition all seems over seventy, but but there's not going to be a whole lot. Well, this is about to be over, and his his rise to power is actually an indication itself because he doesn't really fit. I mean, for all of Trump is a far rightist in a lot of ways, like he's not in others. I mean, if you looked at his actual policy positions, in some ways he's way more moderate than. Or he said he was until he picked Mike Pence and started trying to court the evangelicals again. Mm. And the the same was true with Bush, which we for, we really forget this. You know, Bush became more and more right wing after nine eleven, but he actually came out as the moderate in the Republican Party because we forget about like Pat Robertson and Pat Buchanan actually having a viable chance to win the Republican nomination. And uh, and W in the nineties, yeah. And well, yeah, you have Pat Robertson at, at the speaking with a weird. Pat Buchanan speaking at the at the at the RNC back in ninety two is a scary thing, but then eight years later you have W uh, running as God what a f- <laughs> remember yeah, that's compassionate that, conservative yeah compassionate conservative yeah it was like just bring it you have to laugh at just the, the what a, fucked up memories of that what the uh, two thousand election I mean well I mean in some ways the trauma on nine eleven like wipes a lot of that out and 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 we are increasingly in an age where people don't even remember that so. I mean that, and that time created a lot of weird political bedfellows. I mean, you had like Gore Vidal writing stuff defending Timothy McVeigh, you know, and <laughs> it is a very weird time. In, re- in retrospect, it's even weirder than it it felt at the time. Um, um, uh, one thing is like, is it? I'm almost wondering, is it better to? <laughs> is it better to uh, ways of dealing with trauma? Is it better to uh, to actively process it, or is it better just, or is it just, or just to forget? Because it's I don't know. At some point, I mean, it's like it's like it's, it's like the shit is just ebbing away, not having been actively processed. You know, to use therapeutic terms. I, I, here's what I don't know. I don't know if some of what we're seeing right now would you know, um, to use a conservative term, but I think one that's actually true. And it was funny because Ross Dunn had of all people made an argument that I've been making for years. It's like we live in the age of woke capital. You know. Yeah, that was. But, yeah. But that that's not new. All right, people have been pointing that out since the 60s. Let's be fair. It's just funny now because it's like like 
the left is forgetting its own history and and that you know i keep on hitting that we have to we are historic we are historical we want to change history but to change history we must remember it and understand it and so in that sense i don't think forgetting the trauma is good but like from a personal level hell yeah it's better to forget like i don't want to relive all that shit again i don't want to remember what it was like i mean I mean, for like for me personally, nine eleven actually profoundly affected me. My girlfriend at the time was from Johnstown, Pennsylvania, like you know, and I had friends who were in New York. Yeah, my like brother, had, my brother, very good, real to me. Yeah, my brother, good friends in New York. I was, we were, we were. Uh, the day it happened, I was getting the car, uh, the the oil change in the car, and getting it scooped because we were gonna we were gonna be driving from Ann Arbor, uh, from like Michigan, to yeah. to Newark because CMJ was that weekend. For the college, the, the college music journal new music fest, and mm-hmm. like a bunch of us were we were just going to road trip, and uh, then that, and then it happened on a Tuesday, and we were supposed to leave on a Thursday, and that was that, and we we wound up going, we were we were in Manhattan like the you know, a month later when they rescheduled it, right in time for all the anthrax scares to start happening. So, oh God, yeah, that was. I mean, it, it, Man, I remember, and this is weird flashback time. We're going to alienate all your younger listeners, but. Um, it's Jacob, interesting are we, to think are we about. Alien, Jacob, are we alienating, alienating you with our with our with our geezer talk? Well, I mean, I'm pretty much in a perpetual state of alienation, but you know, I was a teenager during 9/11, so oh, okay. Oh, so yeah, you're not like a like a a Gen Zer who thinks we're just utterly weird right now. No, but I would draw a connection actually between 9/11 and the school shootings. Which is that I think there's, you know, I, I, I was out of high school basically right around Columbine. And it's interesting because I have my boss has a kid who's in high school and hearing her talk about high school is really shocking because, you know, we have things like active shooter drills and uh, they're changing doors and going through all these things of, okay, here's what you do if somebody tries to come into your school and tries to murder you that are just totally alien to me. And I remember I was having a conversation with somebody about this, and I said, how do you feel about the fact that you know you have a young kid who's being brought up in this environment where they're constantly being told that they are under imminent mortal threat and doing all these routines to try to deal with that and that we have a huge fight right now you know at the federal level about how to respond to that and he answered well you know i i statistically speaking i guess i'm not that worried about my kid getting murdered and i said well no the question was how do you feel about the fact that we're basically raising them raising our kids in the state of constant threat and i remember after 9 11 how there was this constant drumbeat of you are not terrorism, safe. Yeah. yeah, you are not safe. You are not, you know, ever going to be able to be safe unless you're willing to give up these essential liberties. Right. And, and I it, see this as yeah. sort of a, a repetition of that same thing. Well, it's just interesting to me that because to, to me this is kind of like the the Cold War made small. If, if there's any, there's, if there's a paleo conservative argument that I actually kind of agree with and i'm going to get in trouble for saying i agree with anything paleoconservative is that the cold war was the start of us being willing to 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 do that um as as far as like in the united states goes because the threat of a nuclear annihilation was always yeah, bandied about duck and cover um, and drills and whatnot yeah which and, is another um, I mean, area where i think you can t- you know make a connection between these uh, yeah i grew up with nuclear bomb drills by the way even though like because georgia's was really behind and so they, they didn't stop that <laughs> yeah, I, I grew up in uh, yeah I grew because I, I grew up in Michigan, so we had tornado drills. <laughs> yeah, we we had tornado drills and nuclear bomb drills. We had real tornado drills too. Um, and I've been teaching since 2007. I've been uh, I was a senior in high school when Columbine happened. If you really want to date me, and we we kicked a kid out of school for making an off color joke. Like he was expelled for it. But we and we were all shocked because nothing like that had happened before. You know. Um, but the funny thing is, is Columbine's the beginning of this mass shooter phenomenon like we think about it, but actual mass shootings in schools have actually, they've increased since, um, from like late nineties levels, but historically they're actually lower now than they've, than they were at other time periods. Like I didn't know they were common in the fifties. Did you know that? 
That one, no. Okay. I, I did know about the story about, was it a guy who walked into like, what, like an elementary school, loaded down with dynamite, and, you know, just suicide bombed himself. I think that was like 30s. Was it? Okay. Yeah. Something like that. It yeah. Was... So, so, so it, the, they were fairly common in the 50s and 60s, and basically they just weren't reported on because they didn't want to freak people out. There was a cosmetology school that got shut up in, I think, 66 in Mesa, and the guy basically said, you know, I, everybody thought Whit, Whit, Charles Whitman was a big deal, so I wanted to do it. Uh, uh, another thing that isn't talked about is um, in the 80s and early 90s, schools were actually sites of the gang wars. And I actually remember this because there was gang violence at my high school. Um, I did, yeah, where I lived in the they, suburbs. We just remembered 21 episodes of 21 Jump Street. <laughs> but I mean, like, uh, well, I mean, I actually lived in the suburbs, too, but the, uh, a city gang actually came into the suburban high school that I went to and stabbed a guy in the middle of this in, in, in the middle of the hallway. Um, and like, I saw that. Um, Jeez. Maybe explain some things about my personality. But um, uh, so, like, I remember that. And then I remember the, what made Columbine different was not that it was a violent an act of, of, of deadly violence in school, but it was that it was random. It was that it wasn't um, it wasn't gang related, but we have kind of retroactively made the the it's not gang related into it never it didn't happen before then. And it totally did. And w there has been an increase in school shootings between um, 2008 and, and now, for example, and definitely, I think, since the late 90s and now. But if you look at the historical trends, they're still lower than they were in the 60s and 70s, which no one thinks about. There being school shootings in the 60s and 70s. And also, like, of course there kind of were. Because, like, until the 80s, hell, in the 80s, I, you could bring a gun to school and you you, you would probably not even get in that much trouble in as the, long as you didn't use it. Yeah, like, the 60s, there were no weapons bans on schools. Yeah, that's the – my dad talks about when he was in high school in the 60s because um, – you'd bring you bring your you'd bring your kids would go off hunting after um you know after school so you'd stick you know your your rifle was in your locker well, well your shotgun but yeah well they had they had they had gun clubs both my both my stepfather and my grandparents were in gun clubs that had shooting ranges on a school campus right. so like yeah it, yeah, I mean, it's like one of those weird. It's like one of those weird, like forgotten bits of like past life and culture that no one really remembers. Like you know, it just seems shocking today. Like the fact that people used to, you know, people used to smoke in church. Yeah, people used to smoke in church. Oh, there used to be a smoking section in, in schools in my lifetime. Really? In that? the eighties, there was there was in Georgia that, in the eighties. Oh, there Georgia. were in, in, okay. They would have like a section for the over eighteen smokers to go smoke. They sound extremely cool. <laughs> I mean, it's so weird when I talk about this, but like I could, I remember there being when I was in elementary school. You go by the high school, and there was a smoking area for people who were over eighteen. Yeah, it was called the teachers' lounge. It's called the badass. Well, there's lounge. that too, but everything smelled of cigarettes in the eighties too. It's weird when I think about it, actually. <laughs> but anyway, so I guess the, to tie, kind of bring this back in, number three, the past is a lot more foreign than you think it is. Remind we're, we need to remind ourselves of that that things have changed even now. You know, I I see these things like it, it's a it's a very a very common thing um, to say oh stuff hasn't changed very much you know uh, in education or whatever. Um, they've it's changed a shit ton actually, you know, and and people just don't really realize it. Yeah, well, I mean, when you and I were growing up, you could beat kids in school like it was legal. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I mean, if, I, I, yeah. Go, going back to the weather underground, I mean, they carried out literally thousands of bombings, and I think about how, even if they were, you know, non-lethal, if that were happening today, how much of an absolute meltdown we would have nationally. Yo, know, yeah, there's something like I, I was reading in Days of Rage. There was something like six thousand left left political bombings um and what, it's actually interesting how few people they killed um not including themselves yeah not including themselves because they usually actually if anyone died it was them yeah um but but could you imagine if like the dsa was blowing up shit constantly <laughs> I mean, like you know it's it's 
it's we we just have decontext something about facebook culture has done this weird thing and where a lot of the stuff in the past has become a lot more shareable and so we kind of think we understand it because we share these things about oh remember move or remember this or remember that right 30 years ago when the move activists were bombed here in philadelphia the ways in which this country was terrorizing black communities i'd love to say that things are totally different from then to now but in so many ways the attacks on our movement continue to persist but we don't we forgot it's it's also decontextualized um, so we, we're we sharing it without all of its context. And that's a problem because we it leads us to think we understand the past more than we do. And that also leads us to be hubristic about the future more than we are, more than we should be. Um, and uh, that's, a, that's another issue. I think another issue you – I know you wanted to talk about me about this specifically, Jeremy, but about morality – and its relationship to politics. Yeah, that's the one because at some point it, it's been something I've been thinking about us. But at some point, like I don't know, like the seventies, when you know personal moral purity and per, not just moralizing, but the, the psychological setup that you know that made moralizing such a, a, a major tactic. Like when did that actually happen? Where it's, it's almost like you know the idea that you would do something that wasn't personally uh, you know like, that would affect your own moral purity was something you do as a tactic or something was acceptable. It was just it seems so foreign. It's um. So, so here's the thing. I think having your moral compass is, and a lot of leftists don't have the moral compass together. And then people are always like, well, you always tell us not to be. No, I'm like, I, I don't tell you not to be moral. You have to be moral. But I also tell you, politi- pol- politics is not about morality. It is not the personalist political came out of. And this is where I think what you're talking about came out of the 60s. That was and, the uh, that was the first lesson uh, from the last podcast, which is be immoral. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Um, the personalist political is it came out of the '60s, and what that was about is that like leaders in the communist movement, and you know, you still see it today, would like protect people um, from from charges of wife beating and stuff more than even right wingers would. All right, that's true. It was a true fact that we did that, and we still do it. You still see like, the, why do all these left groups have rape scandals? Because any uh, most of the sectarian ones do. Um, so. Well, that was about outing that, but somehow the personal got p- political became my subjectivity should be universalized. That my understanding of our, my subjectivity should be universalized, and that any breach of that is a violation of, of both myself and my political subject. For example, which, um, the idea that, oh man, um. That, for example, like if you consume immoral media, you are, you know, immoral yourself. Or that. I wish Natasha was here. Yeah, we our third co-host uh, is uh, would be with us, but she is off in Seattle at a uh, at a comics convention. But that is also and, and, a topic she is particularly we'll, passionate about. Yeah. What what is that? The the the, uh, the idea of. Of the, the the idea of 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 squickiness having political import that consuming immoral you know what is deemed immoral or problematic podcasts immoral media makes you you know imparts its immorality onto you thus making you immoral for voluntarily you know voluntarily um, enjoying this immoral media or art. So is she on my side or against me on this? I think she, no she's no she's definitely no she's. Um, she, uh, uh, you know, don't want to speak out of turn. She can represent herself better, far better than we can. But though no, she's talked about a lot, how about how, um, like really pushing back against a lot of people, like trying to trying to, again, you know, moralistically scorn. Hey, you are bad because you enjoy this, like, you know, like this dark, um, this dark story or something like that. It's like you know, hey, you know, it's like as if you know, almost like some sort of like what like Stalinist idea that your own personal choices in fan fiction should uh, only reflect proper party or you know society acceptances right so um and so she's, she's an anti-puritan good um yeah um so i i had the same suspicions that uh we really must one, I, 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 there's an Adornian maxim that I'm going to throw out that's going to make a lot of people seem like I'm super, super, super pessimistic. And maybe it's so they just did a whole podcast on Adorno for talking to you. But um, a, a, a wrong 
life cannot be lived rightly. And if you if you think you can, you know, like, by your choices, um, live morally in a fundamentally immoral world, but by, by just your choices, that's actually a weird atomistic view. And so it, I hate to say it's a neoliberal view because that's abused, but it kind of is. Yeah. It certainly it's yeah so it seemed it definitely seems like the like that mentality came uh, you know became much more popularized in the seventies when all the economic you know just in time for all the economics to change too, right and you know and I, I also tend to, even though I think privilege is a is a is a good metaphor for things I don't think it explains much I think it's just a metaphor to explain structural inequality between non for factors that are not explicitly class based all right right um. But uh, it's just a metaphor. Yeah. <laughs> it's not actually, you know, a thing that has any explanatory power in and of itself. And um, that uh, for the same reason, that's like, oh, you can, you, you're privileged, therefore, you know, whatever. And what that does is it personalizes something that's structural mm-hmm. while claiming that you're still being structural. But like, you know, you should just be aware of your privilege. It doesn't matter if you're aware of your privilege. Let's be honest. Yeah, like, Phoebe, Phoebe <laughs> Maltzbovi's book uh, actually wrote a book. Wrote uh, her book, Perils of Privilege, talks about that. That's at some point uh, being aware of your privilege, unquote, tends just to be re- uh, mean like, you know, you performatively acknowledge something. And as long as you have done that or you conduct yourself in such a way that constantly, um, you know, you're constantly talking about it. Everything's Jake. Yeah. And, and that doesn't really it doesn't really matter. I mean, let's, let's, it doesn't change much, actually. To be aware, being aware of something like that doesn't change the privilege itself. It doesn't undo structural inequities. It doesn't undo white power. It doesn't undo, it doesn't do undo class inequities. And oh my God, don't even get me started on the idea of classism. Like, it's not a thing. I mean, for one thing, uh, even though I, I generally think a lot of the critiques of intersectionality tend to be um, straw men, um, myself, and this is funny because I'm a, for some reason I'm linked to that. But um, <laughs> I, I do, I do actually think, in this one sense, the idea that these things are intersectionally just equal. And they work the same way. That's not true. I mean, even sex and you like even like sex, gender, and race don't work the same way. Much less like class or um, disability or any of that. They're, those, they're not actually good enough. Anal- they're not really analogous to one another. Um, and you do have to look at the way they relate to each other. And. I actually try not to privilege one or the other. I just say as a socialist, what I'm primarily concerned with is is um, economic hierarchies and then political hierarchies, right? Like, and um, but I, I've actually said that I, I think under socialism, racism and sexism will be will still be things. They'll just be completely different things. Like the the socialist racism and sexism will look different than capitalist racism and sexism does. Oh, so but they'll still be there. Well, because they'll be manifested in different ways. Like structural inequality means a lot less when when like everybody has fairly equal access to to um, training or the other things we now currently associate with capital. That will look very different in a society. But nations like nations, I don't, nation states will probably go away. But nations aren't like the idea of historical peoples aren't going to go away. There's nothing about social that's just going to make the, the the historical weight of whiteness and blackness, even though it came out of, you know, enlightenment imperialism itself, you know, just go away overnight. Yeah, no, even yeah. if we got rid of every element of capitalism, there's still parts of that that are not going to go away immediately. The uh, economics will be gone, but the tribalism will still be there in some form. Yeah. Tribalism to me is transhistorical, and it's part of a dialectical problem that you're always going to have. You have a particular and universal, and you can't just wave that away by getting rid of capital. But capital, I guess that's point five. And so when people are like, "Well, if you know capitalism is structurally racist, and if we just get rid of capitalism, we get rid of racism," you know, the, the liberals aren't wrong that that's kind of bullshit, guys. Like that's not true. Um, the Russification policy of of uh, the Soviet Union wasn't because it was state capitalist. There was something else going on there. Hmm. Um, So, which is to say that it might have been state capitalist. I actually don't take a stand on that. That's a side note. But um, because I think whether or not you think it's deformed bureaucratic collectivism or deformed works of state or deformed 
or if it's form state capitalism, it depends on exactly what function you think is primary in capitalism or our political economy. And that's not an objective question. So gotcha. I don't feel like having that argument. But um, the idea that that a that a system that didn't work like uh, um, American or European capitalism would still have racism as indication that it was still really capitalist. I don't think that's true. I think that it could have easily, but the, the Russification was a, a was was a failure of internationalism, for sure. But it didn't it it did not mean that um, the USSR was this racism was sick. And and oh my God, their opinions on sexuality. I mean, like. I mean, it's funny that we associate Maoism with like the most and quote unquote woke on sexuality issues. They thought you know, um, homosexuality was a bourgeois deviation, hmm. and and we just forgotten that. Um, uh, because I mean, I guess maybe this brings me to point seven. There are things that Marxism doesn't explain that you have to explain with like I don't know basic science and anthropology, <laughs> right? You know. Um, and that uh, we have to deal with, but maybe aren't necessarily the same thing like as dealing with capital. And I, I, it leads to real problems because I think a lot of the way leftists want to handle, um, like, say, identity issues is like nationalism, like like left nationalism. OK, because that was the historical way to handle it. But that doesn't really work anymore. Like, how do you in the United States, how would you separate you know, um, the settler from the non-settler community and where does, and where did the black community fit in in settlerism since they didn't choose to be here, but they also aren't from here, you know, and, and all these models, um, uh, you know, oh, you know, the West was really part of Mexico. Well, they stole it from the Apache and all the native Americans too. And they were settled colonialists as well. Like, so where are you going to stop that history? Where, where are you going to just pick a point and this, okay, so we did, we just need to go back to this. It doesn't work. You can't undo the past. You can't undo, like, even if all the federal colonial theories are completely true, you can't undo it now. You can't just, like, make it go away. There's not going to be a thousand socialist um, Native American nations on on the North American continent. That will never happen. Because you can't just you, you can't redeem history that way. That's eschatology. That's not politics. Hmm. Um, and that's another mistake. Like we like we have to create a a a um, political situation that can deal with the particular, um, the experience of African Americans, the experience of Native Americans, the experience of different even white groups. All right, I, I get really tired of all this whiteness talk, because in a way it reifies whiteness itself. It makes the situation worse. Like, like, white. What is whiteness exactly? Not blackness, not brownness. Well, it seems to me that like there are some his there are some Latinos who are clearly fit into the right regime, and some who don't. Um, and, and et cetera and so forth. We can't. It it doesn't really map on clearly, and we need to be more nuanced in the way we understand these categories. Well, I mean, that's arguably a, a feature of whiteness for some people, which is that it is fundamentally exclusionary by some people's definition. Well, it is. But the thing is, blackness is fundamentally exclusionary. Everything is. But like that's a, that's that's otherness is fundamentally exclusionary. You don't you don't undo an other, though, by positing another other. Right. But my argument was that. For some people don't want to undo it, so that's what they use it for. I mean, there's a leading alt right guy uh, who's been making a bunch of noises about the ethno state, whose name is Nick Fuentes. So, oh yeah, I mean, the, totally. I mean, the, also the the uh, uh, Paul Gottfried, who is argued, even though he's denounced Richard Spencer and all that now, um, he literally came up with the term alt right. You know, he's a Jew. Mm -hmm. Um. You know, and and, uh, you know, my own history, like I identify as white because I feel like I didn't choose to identify as white. I just am. Right. But like genetically, I'm not even mostly European. And like my heritage is a mixture of North African, Jewish and Irish. You know, 
And uh, historically speaking, I, I, at best, I was provisionally right until the 50s, you know, my, my ethnic groups. But that doesn't matter to me, right? Like, that doesn't change my my right privilege, even though I'm from a complete, it's got a completely different historical lineage than, say, wasp white privilege does. But when we talk about it in, like, this blank term about whiteness, it, it kind of undoes all that. Um. And I don't, I don't really know who it helps. I feel like if anything, it, and I'm not blaming the victim here, but it is, I've known a lot of people who, who, be, who flirted with white nationalism um, out of the sense that, that they um, didn't understand or whatever that all these things were contingent. And they felt that if, if, Everybody gets to have a you know a national identity, and white people have been assumed to be the national identity, but can't be anymore. Then we should have our own identity politics too. Now, I'm not saying that that's a smart way to think. It's not. I'm not saying that like black that like black consciousness is what's caused that. I don't think that at all. But it is kind of a logical conclusion from all this whiteness talk, particularly if you're a lower middle class white person and you're being told this by upper middle class white people. Which is, and frankly, most people's experience of this, particularly in the Midwest, where there's not a lot of, you know, where minorities are, are not as readily available um, in some ways. I mean, th there are, there's large minority centers in all major cities, even in the Midwest, but it's still not, it's not the same way as like in the South. And I'd, I'd be interested to see the demographics on, on where these from. I mean, one of the most interesting factors to me is, um, one of the largest right nationalist groups um, that I know about before this whole resurgence under Trump was actually BANA, which is the uh, Bay Area National Anarchist. And that a lot of the leadership, like um, Jared Taylor, who's a hardcore racist, they all come from California. And that's fascinating to me um, because that you, 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 would, you would not necessarily suspect that. But that that does seem to be the case. Um, Richard Spencer, you know, um, he wrote his thesis in college on Adorno. You know, th these are not people who don't have fairly liberal, fairly even left background educations. Not the leadership. Now, a lot of them are libertarians now, but the founders were not. All right. Um... So, anyway. <laughs> Time to start drawing things into a close. Any reading recommendations you would like to make? Read the critique of the Goethe program by Marx. Like for real, you should do that because most of you don't realize you're Lasallians. Um, <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, what else? Uh, Are there any authors that you find particularly compelling of late? Oh, um, you know, I've been reading a lot of medieval history and a lot of history of capitalism develop, uh, capitalist development, and also I've been reading a lot of I've been reading a lot of history on the shift in Europe from thinking about religion in Christendom to thinking about nations to thinking about race. Um, I I do think Abraham Kindy, I believe, um, his book on uh, Sam from the Beginning to Definitive: A History of Racist Ideas in America is really good. I mean. Um, even though it's kind of normative race theory, he does a really good job on like tracing these ideas into the development of imperialism. I mean, the idea, ironically, um, he's where I, I from one of the most funniest ironies in American history, the idea of whiteness and blackness being used as a, as a category of peoples comes from the Portuguese when they started the slave, when they started doing the uh, transatlantic slave trade. And ironically, the Portuguese themselves were considered colored in America for about 20 years. You know, they weren't they weren't given the category of whiteness that they themselves kind of came up with. And I, it, you know, I got that from his book on um, Stamp from the Beginning, which I think is really good, even though it's not Marxist in any, any strict sense of the word. I think it's a good book. Um, I've been reading Rodney Stark, who's a conservative, actually, conservative sociologist, um, critiques of the Reformation. And he talks about, he actually talks about the development of capitalism in a way that I think is really, from a Marxist perspective, really good. Um, uh, 
and he was talking about how it developed in religious circles but was only nationalized later after the Reformation. Um, and that's important in some ways. I'd read a book on the Frankfurt School, um, not just their primary theories, but also their trajectory and what happened to them. Didn't yeah, um, Verso has a good a one's Hotel Grand Abyss? Yeah, that's the one. The one that Verso just put out. Yeah, that's that's a really good book. Um, I have that one on my shelf. I still need to read it. Um, and I would read. Uh, let's see, if you can find good books on. Uh, the labor movement in America and labor law. And I don't have a specific one in mind right now because there's actually a dearth of this. But we did. If you, anything you can grab on the history of labor law and how it's different from state to state, because I think a lot of people ba- do not realize how divided and uneven even you know, label struggles were even within the U.S. You know, and I don't mean like, oh, let's watch Mate One and get our politics from that. Like, you know, even though Mate One's kind of cool for, for, like, Appalachia. You think this man is your enemy? Huh? This is a worker. Any union keeps this man out ain't a union. It's a goddamn club. Now, they got you fighting white against colored, native against foreign, holler against holler. When you know there ain't but two sides of this world, them that work and them that don't. You work, they don't. That's all you got to know about the enemy. But like really dig into those histories if you can, anything you can get. And unfortunately, there's not a lot of good books on it right now. So um, articles, information, legal history reviews, read as much of that as you can. Um, And the other thing I'm going to tell people and if you read Jacobin or um, The Baffler, or any, uh, that's all fine. But actually read some bourgeois economics because you do need to like have that context in your head. Um, because, you know, Chomsky used to point this out. Fi- f- financial papers, their editorial sections are agitprop, but their reporting's actually not because they actually really have to run, you know, they really do kind of run things and they actually really do have to know what's going on. And so The Economist still does better reporting than a lot of left outlets, even though it's totally ideologically nuts and its editorial page is kind of not healthy for you. But its reporting is usually actually pretty good. And um, people need to read that. They really do. I mean, I, I, I don't like normally echoing Chomsky, but he wasn't wrong about that. Cool. Jacob, you anything you want to uh, recommend every folks check out? No, I think I'm good. Okay. Although what about I, you, I, Jeremy? I, what do you what do you suggest? Um, I, I have a couple general suggestions. Uh, I have when I, one completely irrelevant pop cultural suggestion. Uh, just a, just a, I was gonna say if you ever get a chance, uh, the two seasons are, are are of it are out. Watch the Good Place, which is okay. It was a done by put together by Michael Sher and a couple other people from like kind of like Parks and Rec, but it is. Um, it's a it's 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 an it's kind of shockingly good for an NBC network sitcom where like the old the old put out it's it's effectively it's like a collection of like you know uh like ethics classes in the form of a sitcom and um where the point where they where they I mean one of the one of the episodes they literalize the trolley problem because it takes place in kind of this weird afterlife setup um, and where at one point they, uh, cause it's about like it, it, positing that if there's like this, this ethical system, then how do you, you know, how do you learn how to be better? And like, they'll make, they'll make like Richard Rorty and like, they'll make, they'll make Kierkegaard jokes or directly reference, you know, like, uh, you know, because one of the, char- one of the main characters was an ethics professor and he'll talk about his work. Cause at one point all the main characters are like, okay, we want to learn how to be better. How do we do that? And he'll, and he starts teaching them and like starts teaching them classes. And it's, um, it is very well done and extremely hilarious. Like I said, it is surprisingly good and pretty, uh, pretty, uh, they name check a lot of good things for what is a, uh, like a network sitcom. See, this can be the future of education. What if we just turn all our sitcoms into classes on various subjects? The, uh, the ethics professors have already written that they're using certain segments of the show to illustrate points in their classes. See, there you go. 
So yeah, cool. check out, so check out the yeah, check out the good place. Uh, I've been writing poetry books. Oh, mine's coming out. Oh when, yeah, yeah, when, so, yeah, yeah. Talk yeah, about your book when... in April, end of April. Um, it's called Apocalyptics. It doesn't have anything to do with what we're talking about, but except that it's a very critical of the Afghan war. It has a picture of Trump being exploded on the cover, but that's that wasn't my doing. Ah, so <laughs> there you go. Fun with book publisher. So yeah, you're so yeah. Check out the uh, Derek Varn's book coming. Uh, Apocalypse. Who's putting? Do you remember who's putting it out? Unlikely Books. It's a small press out of Louisiana. There you go. On Unlikely Books. All right. Well, and then yeah, uh, yeah. Oh yeah, buy Zero Books books. Um, uh, something other than Kill All Normies. I mean, Kill on Armies is fine, but read read other things we do. Yeah. Um, um, I, I guess my big suggestion is that there's a sequel, even though it's not by us, it's being released, I think, by Verso because they stole this author from us. Uh, um, the sequel to Heavy Radicals is coming out about the rest of the history of the RCP and the SDS. And when that comes out, I would suggest people read that as well. In fact, yeah, I think we've had we've had uh, the Zero Books publisher uh, Doug Lane on the show twice. Even in fact, we're just about to put out his, the second episode where uh, a bunch of us talk about UFOs and things go predictably awry after that. He, he keeps yeah. representing, um, I believe, uh, I think it's called Writing on the Wall. Yeah, um, it, it's funny. Uh, uh, Doug and I uh, work together. I, I technically work for him, and um, I, he's sort of the um, the vision behind the publication and I'm sort of the, uh, the voice of no, um, the editor. So, well, well, he's actually the publisher and I, yeah, I, I guess I'm the editor, but it's more just, I'm always like, you know, this is not a great idea to, <laughs> um, uh, so, you know, this is kind of how it works now. Um, and, uh, I, I will say this: work, even though it's like not my day job, like it is for Doug, and in, uh, in a very real way, I'm mostly a teacher. Um, uh, working in the left wing book publishing world and in the left wing article world is surreal. Um, it's a very strange place, and it's <laughs> it's it, it's easy to get distracted and and forget that there's other stuff going on. That'll happen. All right. Cool. Yep. Oh, All right, Jacob. Do you have any, anything to anything to add or any concluding words or? Check out Barkles dot dog. Yeah, I was saying, how can uh, how can uh, Derek? How can folks get a hold of you or or follow uh, follow up with you if if um, you have any? Like, you have anything anything else aside from the book that you'd not want to plug? Uh, I am constantly on the Patreon section of Inside Zero Books, which is uh, you get from the Zero Square podcast. I do a podcast, another podcast called Amanda emancipation which is irregularly published you can find it on soundcloud i don't know how um, syndicated it is yet i'm on the uh transcendentally tangential tangent podcast coming up soon i blog at symptomatic commentary on wordpress and i am a facebook personality apparently i also still maintain a dream with account which is kind of like live journal but indie and doesn't matter really was relevant 10 years ago but hey i might like grr martin in that way <laughs> pointed uh pointed commentary jacob anything well not exactly because you have a book coming out <laughs> oh bam <laughs> burn jacob anything else other than and then uh the barkle uh the barkles game no i'm good Okay, uh, that's been it. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for listening. Thank you, uh, thank you, Jacob, for joining. And thanks for uh, uh, Derek for calling in again on a lo- uh, lovely Sunday. Well, freezing over there Sunday afternoon. Um, get see, see, find you can f- email the show at giving the uh, giving the mic at gmail.com you find us at facebook.com slash giving the mic i've been your host jeremy our theme song is by i keep screwing up his name it's something like the because he's got a weird name like the mysterious breakfast seriler and who you know pretty much gave me a a, a theme song for free so I, I throw him some credit and um also, we also we now we now have a YouTube page where I just I found out that I can export shows to YouTube and you know someone you know, like us on there or follow us it's you'd be surprised just by having people like subscribe to the show does for uh, does for support um, I want to thank everybody for listening again um, thank you Derek thank you Jacob and final words from everybody where am I supposed to find the time to read all those books uh, I don't know. Um, it's funny. Um, the major complaint people have about me is I'm always telling people to do more work. And, uh, so, you know, do more work. But, uh, also, um, go outside, peoples, and, like, 
do other things. Don't okay, just be that's, an alienated before. That's a that's a that's a deal breaker. Sorry. So, Varn, I'm gonna help you out. All right. I'm gonna do you a big favor. What's that? Okay. Uh, for best picture, we've got The Shape of Water, Darkest Hour, and Dunkirk. Shape of Water, man. Yeah. Oh, the Dunkirk's pretty okay. I mean, you know, as World War II propaganda films go, it's more interesting than Private Ryan. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's not even uh, really a war film in a lot of ways. It's just sort of a horror or disaster film than just people. Yeah, it, it is sort of a disaster film as far as genre goes. And fascinatingly, um, you know, my only problem with it is even though I think it's cool, I don't know why he does what, why Nolan can't let go of his narrative tricks in that movie. Cause they're not actually essential to anything. And they're just kind of confusing. Yeah. They don't, they don't add a lot. Uh, let's see. Uh, the post phantom thread, three billboards, Call Me By Your Name and Lady Bird are also on the list. Oh, man. The Post is a uh, Spielbergian liberal schlock. So you're thinking that's that's going to win? That's that's what you're going to Probably. Yeah, I mean, just because, you know, it's it makes everyone feel good. Um, I don't know. Okay, so that, that makes the old liberals feel good. What would make the woke swa feel good? Wilkes Swath well, for for like what? For, I just got back for Best Picture. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if 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 you were the Wilkes Swazi, what would you want? Get out. Well, I Get mean, there. what about Call yeah. Me by Your Name? Oh, no. Either one of them. I mean, or like I mean, Ladybird, I remember maybe? when the Wilkes Swath was all over um, Drive, and in that movie does not age well at all. Wait, what um, movie? Drive. Yeah, we they wouldn't been the Wilkes Swath then, but it was like you know the the liberal identity people and and what's funny about that is that movie has not aged at all in in, in that favor it just says a lot about that soundtrack um, was good i liked it a lot I, I always heard that drive you know cronenberg's drive should have won best picture but i'm one of the few people who even remember that movie so like, like cronenberg's drive or cronenberg's crash crash drive whatever that's, okay okay, okay th- that's, the one, that's the one where <laughs> where car accidents make you super horny right yeah, I'm thinking about the other crash, which was the one that was was like super woke to light um, <laughs> yes. when it came out. Oh, so like you... in retrospect, it's it's got terrible identity politics. Yeah, no, that's but... that's the one where uh, being racist makes you super horny. Right. Yeah. Um, the, yeah. Drive. But... Drive was like five. Drive was like was the was the Ryan Gosling flick a few years right. later. See, this is how out of touch. Drive came out when I was abroad, so like I knew it existed and I've seen it, but like it has no cultural impact to me. Oh, okay. And I don't have the cultural memories that I have for like Crash, where like everybody was like, "This movie is a sensitive portrayal of racism," and they you and it's really funny to go back and like listen to that from the time and then uh, see watch the way people deal with it now. there was a really good episode of Chopper that got into that. You should check it out. <laughs> oh, you're just open. Yeah, thank you for openly baiting our guests. 